Loonies, you are listening to episode 20 of Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. I'm one of your high priests, Ray. And I am your other high priest, Connor. And this week, we have the massive Disney and Fox deal, as well as two crack... Cracking? Cracking classic issues, let's go with that, <laughs> with Defenders Volume 1, Issue 47, and uh, Moon Knight... Oh, wait, 48... <laughs> as well as Moon Knight Volume 3, Issue 1, the first part in the Resurrection Mall miniseries. So sit back, relax, grab your issues out, and get your conchu on. Yes, welcome back, Loonies. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Hello, Connor, how are you? I am doing mighty fine, Ray. Always good to be back in the recording studio. It's just my room with the microphone <laughs> attached. Yes, How about but, yourself? Oh, yeah, very, very good indeed. I just wanted to um, yeah, just wanted to say how, how things have been going with you. I heard you uh, just started a new job as well, so all, all going well on the, on the job front? Uh, sure is. It is busy hours, so we're kind of apologies for the um, late one this week, but Oh no! Yeah, that's that's okay. Too bad that's at all. Okay. Still, still making sure I'm keeping up with my pull list and everything, good and glorious with comics throughout the week. Yeah, it's it's um, it's getting to that part of the year, isn't it? And uh, I know there's a lot of catch ups with friends and family, which which are good, and there's a, it's a bit of planning as to what to do over Christmas and New Year's. Mm. Um, so yeah, it is a bit of a busy busy time, but um, fear not, loonies, we're here to uh, hopefully get you the news across for, for Moon Knight and, uh, and, and anything in the comics world, actually. Uh, I wanted to kind of segue into our, I guess, our, our news bits, Connor. Um, this week, uh, there's one of the main ones being uh, the big Disney deal with Fox. Yeah, so it actually went ahead this week that uh, Disney is buying out Fox, uh, getting back some of their long-lost properties, such as the, of course, the X Men and the Fantastic Four, yep. and as Deadpool. well as plenty of, Sorry. yes, Deadpool. Yeah, well, I mean, plenty of other stuff too in that deal. You know, you basically yeah. get the entire catalog of like Aliens and the Simpsons too from Fox. It's a mammoth deal. What was it? Forty two. Oh, it's a uh, no, something. Fi- no, just under sixty billion. I think it was fifty fifty four or fifty six billion dollars. Absolutely yeah. crazy. It is a monumental. But so uh, I think one of um. I think Derek from the uh, Defenders TV podcast was saying that most of his childhood is now with Disney, like uh, everything <laughs> he grew up with, you know, like even The Simpsons and all that. So uh, it was a massive, massive deal, and it, it ended a lot of um, uh, discussion as to, you know, were you know were the were the Fantastic Four and the X Men going to come across? You know, are they finally going to be into the MCU? Uh, and with the news now, it's um, it hasn't actually eased anyone's uh, thoughts, Connor. Uh, people are still then, you know, banding on one side of it, being, oh, it's a terrible move. The other saying, this is great, we can actually have everyone in the um, in the one universe. What are your thoughts on on this amalgamation of sorts? Well, it's definitely a big deal, and it's definitely something with sort of. Caveats, I suppose, attached. Mm. You know, it's a, it's an awesome deal, and of course, we have so many. Well, basically, the entire Marvel catalog back now, actually, with Marvel in the MCU, bar whatever's going on with Hulk and mm-hmm. Spider Man. Yeah. But and I cannot wait for whatever's going to come out of that. But also, I suppose it is kind of scary having such a large monopoly with one company owning everything. You know what they say about competition helping. That's true. I don't know. But, yep. um, you know, yeah, it's sort of like that. I, I suppose that's a lot of people's sort of worry with sort of, um, just sort of one massive conglomerate owning everything and just sort of the uh, problems that could have when it comes to, you know, basically being able to push the own market when it basically comes to superhero films yep. and all that. But that said, I cannot deny just how excited I am for a proper <laughs> MCU. A Fantastic Four or X Men film, you know, something that just feels right and hopefully will uh, live up to the high expectations. And you know, despite you know some some pessimism there, there's still a lot of uh, optimism for how great hopefully their introduction to the MCU will be. Yeah, I mean, there's 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's always going to, um, I guess, be a bit of um, uh, a bit of bit, bit of uh, I don't know. I guess like uh, <laughs> hesitation towards it. It's um, as you're saying, like the uh, having the monopoly on the um, on the on the whole industry. But but having said that as well, they've still got you know the likes of DC, uh, the DC EU. I mean, albeit you know it having its own problems as well. Uh, and you have what we hear about Valiant Comics actually trying to start up yeah. something and introducing mm, it into true, the actually, I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, so if if anything, if you look at it holistically, it's still kind of like Marvel, kind of getting their getting their toys back, so to speak. So <laughs> it still is a Marvel universe. I, I gather what you mean about you know if you have Sony and if you have Fox and if you have the MCU um, or Disney creating their own sort of styles and then, you know, pushing each other. But uh, I think you still probably will get that competition anyway from from the other um, the other comic publishers. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely... It is an interesting one. It's a shame that the likes of uh, Hugh Jackman, um, who's gone on to say that he... Um, <laughs> that ship has sailed, I think he said. Uh, whether he <laughs> actually, yeah, whether he'd actually return to to play Logan or Wolverine, um, you know, if, if he had a chance to to mix it with the Avengers, uh, it's sad to see that um, not going to happen. But uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see the X Men uh, and uh, and the Fantastic Four actually uh, back at home, you know, and and with Spider-Man and with Captain America and Iron Man. So, uh, yeah, very, very exciting, um, exciting times. Uh, and look, and, and as a consumer as well, um, uh, you know, all the business side of things and, and them taking over and, and such, as a consumer, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really worry me because, you know, I don't really have a say in, in all that um, back-of-house stuff, uh, you know, I'm I'm only there at the end to get the end product, and uh, you know if it's done well, then it, it's done well. So um, yeah, I mean that's kind of how I see it, it as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you feel the same there, Connor. Um, I, yeah, I suppose it's totally just how it will pan out. But you know, honestly, I really do have a lot of faith in these movies going forward. So I suppose moving myself from the business perspective that it's just kind of pure excitement for, you know, the first ever good Fantastic Four film and a whole new era for the Avengers and the X-Men interacting and just sort of side characters. Yeah. It's just another... It's kind of like another um, step for the MCU to present to the audience as, as like a big ticket thing. You know, the very first thing, and I think I mentioned it before, was... Uh, the MCU establishing solo movies and and the big ticket thing was to actually have the Avengers movie for the first time to see them all together and that was all you know they uh they nurtured that over the years and they built up to it and that's what made it so great as well uh then you have like Infinity War now which kind of um is doing the same thing but on a grander scale I guess we've got more players on the field and it's now bringing in the likes of not only the Avengers who we've seen, but we've got like Doctor Strange, we've got Spider-Man, uh, we even have Ant-Man, all the other kind of uh, characters on the outer of the Avengers, they're, they're all kind of mixing it. And we saw that a little bit with uh, Civil War as well, uh, Black Panther as well, of course. Uh, so there's a, a kind of level of excitement for that. And I feel now that the same thing would be uh, this anticipation to actually see actually see um, the Fantastic Four or the X-Men with the Avengers, so I think it's it's um, I think Marvel are in a pretty good place um, to have this, uh, and it could only generate a lot of you know good or bad. It still generates um, curiosity, which I think um, will translate on the uh, in the box office. Uh, but having also said that, Connor, if we um, if we kind of tie it back to our our boy Mooney, Moon Knight, uh, with with this deal now done, how do you see? Um, how do you see that affecting his chances on the on the big screen or the or the TV uh, silver small uh, small screen? I, well, I suppose that's actually really interesting because um, I suppose it's 
it's still such a tumultuous time, you know. Well, actually, the you know the deal kind of reinvigorates the MCU. You know, uh, MCU it almost sort of stops it from stagnating. I mean, it could still stagnate, but it feels like almost whole new life into a pretty full life filled, you know, sort of the uh, franchise movie mm-hmm. franchise. That means it just still has room to grow. And I suppose where Moon Knight fits into this franchise plans to grow, I still think entirely depends on Disney's decision to keep the Netflix universe alive, you know, regardless of whether, you know, they're focusing their efforts on another Moon Knight series, uh, another another X-Men movie or a Fantastic Four movie, you know, that's still so separate. You have the movies, you have the TV, you know, people worried about there being no X-Men movies and Fantastic Four movies stifling the the shows the like I don't think that's gonna happen and I don't think that's gonna hurt the TV area as well because they're kind of dissimilar and even so we've got we've even got Marvel Studios working on X Men TV shows at the moment with Fox mm-hmm. so yeah it just depends as we it still I think entirely depends on this streaming deal disney has and whether we want the um whether they still want the ma ratings and the netflix which is what we got with a uh with a um little bit of a news source from sciencefiction.com posted that uh when it came to the r rating for deadpool that uh disney was still very much on board with keeping that so hopefully we see that translate to the tv show side of things and we can Mm -hmm. just as well see moon knight as we were hoping to see in the Netflix universe. Yeah, I mean, it, it is very uh, reassuring, this article, which basically had um, had Disney CEO Bob Iger, or Iger saying, um, it's Deadpool clearly has been and will be Marvel branded, um, but we think there might be an opportunity for a Marvel R brand for something like Deadpool. Uh, as long as we let the audiences know what's coming, we think we can manage that fine. So they're not dispelling uh, by any means the fact that um, there will be or won't be any R-rated films or or shows on there. It's funny, Connor, like I was just watching today, earlier today, I was watching one of the episodes of Gifted. Um, have you watched any of that yet or is that still on the, still on the, um, on the list? Still on the list. I haven't no. touched. I haven't touched the Runaways either, or caught up with Agents of Shield. So I'm honestly, uh, or finished the Punisher. I am very behind on <laughs> Marvel. Yeah, I'm doing very poorly at the moment. <laughs> oh, look, as long as you're reading good comics, that's uh, that, that's <laughs> the main thing. But yeah, Gifted was. Uh, it's very strange, right? Because I'm a, I'm about five episodes in, and it's a very different show from like the Netflix Punisher. I haven't watched Runaways yet, and it's still a very. I think it's still a very different show from Agents of Shield. Uh, it's more, um, it's more kind of drama based, uh, and it's funny. Uh, Eve uh, came into the room and she had a, a little look at what I was watching, which was gifted, uh, and she, had, she <laughs> contemplated a little and she said, "Oh, you know what? You know these kind of shows, they're kind of like the bold and the beautiful, aren't they? But they're just kind of dressed <laughs> up." And look, I couldn't really, you know, I mean, if you compare it to The Punisher, uh, it definitely, it certainly can come across like that because it is heavy on the drama. Um, it's heavy on the, um, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but all the stars are, are, uh, are eye candy. Let's face it. They're, they're all some model, um, in some capacity or other. Um, but what I was, where I'm going with this kind of was that it's, it's funny because there was a scene that I saw there, um, and they had to do an operation on one of these mutants and he had a, he was shot. Um, and I was thinking as I was watching it, Oh, I wonder how far they'll go. Like with the graphicness, I thought like, you know, surely having having seen the Punisher, they won't go to that extent. They'll probably, you know, flash a bit of blood here and and show her, you know, cutting in, but you won't actually see the cutting in. Uh, I actually, you actually see everything. It was actually quite graphic. Um, wow. And, yeah, I don't know how that would translate, you know, with R-rated or whatever your rating. But to me, that's, um, if you're there... Like if you tag that as a family drama and you're watching it with your, your son and your daughter, your young kids, uh, and she's basically opening this guy's stomach up, like, uh, and, and you see it all. Uh, yeah, it just makes me wonder, look, um, and I do realise that is that is Fox, um, so we're not looking at, um, at Disney yet. But, you know, with shows like that, um, surely you can, you know, there, there seems to be a bit of a, um, a blur as to what you can or can't get away with. 
of course, with the Punisher, uh, Netflix Punisher, there are certain things which you certainly cannot get away with <laughs> on a on a, a a family kind of network show. But yeah, I think there's um yeah, I think we're a lot more uh, audiences are a lot more um I guess uh, savvy to 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 graphic um, graphic content. You know, if if I can say that, um, yeah. So anyway, that that's what I just took away from watching Gifted. So, uh, yeah. Like, yeah, I totally agree. You know, corporations do as corporation does, and I think we can all agree corporations can be dumb and totally out of touch with their audiences. But it just seems like such a crazy decision to remove, you know, that MA branding uh, of TV shows because, you know, even if every single one of them isn't top quality or maybe they sag sometimes. And even with the highlights, I think the fact is there is demand and want for it. Like, you know, I think, I don't think we ever have like complete access to statistics, but the buzz, the Netflix shows that create and the way Netflix talks about, you know, the Punisher being so well received and that being, you know, the most brutal, one yet and just sort of the way defenders had its hype build up and even shows like iron fist had you know great viewership i think it's just i just don't see the almost the the business logic for disney that could even come out of thinking you know no people don't want this and we should cancel it i mm. think there's just such a market and well, yeah. absolutely crazy to lose and that almost kind of reassures me <laughs> The, Maybe the, I'm just being a bit too optimistic. No, I mean, and but there and there is a different market too as well because again, if 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 I look for be the um the devil's advocate and and you know on the shoulder of um uh, erring on the side of caution with these Netflix shows, you know the argument is also that um, these so what you do if you have these say ultra violent shows, ultra violent characters, you immediately lose out your marketability. On, um, on like merchandise and and say like toys and figures, which are a large um, a large pull of, of it as well. So if you I guess if you imagine uh, you know say Star Wars for instance, um, and you know you have your your R two D twos or your Ewoks or your or <laughs> your uh, Jar Jar Binks was I think he was meant to be he was meant to be uh, you know all the cute little marketable um, marketable characters, then then you know you can you can put out a whole line of, of toys you can have them associated with like McDonald's meals and stuff like that and all that all that sort of stuff that goes with it I think goes with a, a figure or character that is is you know is marketable and not um, you know not uh, morally uh, questionable you know say like the Punisher <laughs> um, but at the same time as you're saying on the other on the other side of the fence is that uh, that these Netflix shows are doing really well, you know. So the measure of success is different, and uh, and and I think, um, yeah, I, I, I st- yeah, I'm, I'm like you, Connor. I think there's a, a place for, for both of them, and I think um, just because something is is uh, R-rated or, or higher rating um, with you know graphic um, content, it doesn't necessarily mean that it um, it uh, will be detrimental to a business. Um, a business model, I think. But anyway, that's just me spouting. <laughs> Not and too... the um, success of shows like Runaways and stuff with Cloak and Dagger in the future, I think you can mm. still very much have those separate categories before we move yeah. on to this Disney streaming service that Pravu proves. I'm not sure what the last word I was trying to say was. <laughs> it proves, but it just came out very weird. That <laughs> both markets can exist perfectly side by side and have a yeah. big cinematic universe too. Oh, a- absolutely. I think that's a, um, that's a key to it as well. Is that And you see Marvel kind of like doing that now with, um, you know, with the trying all these different things with the Inhumans, Cloak and Dagger, Runaways. They're, they're trying to cover all forms of the market as well. Not, not just the the street level Marvel Knights kind of, um, you know, Punisher content. So, yeah, I think there's room for everything there, Connor. I agree. And speaking of room for everything, we have sort of a last bit of a, mm-hmm. almost you'd say, speculation. Yes. Sort of discussion from a comic book. Some big, uh, some big Moon Knight fans over there, I think, from the amount of uh, hype Marvel Knights and Moon Knight sort of, gets over there but uh, yeah. it was an article posted a sort of expose or sort of 
thought process about um, could Marvel Knights be Disney's R-rated label? They sort of bring up, um, you know, what they were talking about uh, with the R rating, the Disney buyout and all that um, sort of talk that comes along with it and just sort of hypothesizing and theorizing just where Marvel Knights and characters like Moon Knight and mm-hmm. do they include stuff like Blade and yeah. Yeah, Ghost Rider and now Wolverine 2 could fit inside that universe, which is surely an interesting discussion and yeah. a good piece. Yeah, it's um, it always amazes me. I think it's so cool kind of how, like, uh, whenever they talk about, uh, okay, you know, not only Marvel Knights, but say, um, you know, an R-rated label, I always find it cool how, like, Moon Knight's always associated with it. And, and I know that's obvious because if you look at his recent series' runs, um, and, you know, especially with Houston and, and what he did to Bushman, he's a very dark and, and grim character. But um, it, it's funny, just like having seen Moon Knight, I, I had always associated him earlier on with um, the likes of Spider-Man and Daredevil, who, uh, you know, again, Daredevil's a bit of a street-level character, but um, it seems like more and more now the R-rated lab- label, um, Moon Knight, the likes of the Punisher, and then you get yeah you you do get the darker characters like uh, uh, Ghost Rider and Blade um, in there as well for the, the kind of like the supernatural element. But I find that really cool how uh, <laughs> how Mooney is um, is you know just seen as like a ultraviolet fella, <laughs> which uh, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, and this thing about Marvel Knights, I I can't see why they can't do something like that, Connor. I think that would be great uh, to reignite that. They did have Marvel Knights before in the um, uh, in the cinema. If I if I am correct, I think Punisher Warzone, um, at the beginning of that movie, it had a Marvel Knights logo on front, in front of it oh, as okay. well. Yeah, so they did try to launch something like along the lines of Marvel Knights, but I think... Punisher Warzone, it, it having flopped at the box office, um, it kind of just sealed its fate there. But I think it's well suited for the TV arena um, to have like a yeah a branded Marvel Knights thing. It's it's basically just saying you know this is our this is Disney's Netflix version of uh, of, of Marvel shows. I think that's good. I very much agree. Yeah, there's um not much to add from the great stuff Ray was saying there, but <laughs> we'll say is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And finally, Connor, we have uh, something that you've uh, you've plonked in the notes here, which is a uh, yes, very exciting to see. Yeah. Speaking of Daredevil, um, solicitations for March of next year will be coming out this week. It may even be up by the time you're listening to this. But um, in it, Daredevil has its massive issue 600, mm. and on it is obviously a big arc about the street level of uh. New York, and just sort of what seems to be an arc about, sorry, celebrating sort of the street level in another massive story. So there's no solicitation actually attached as far as I could find, but an image is Daredevil atop a sort of gargoyle-type statue, and Mm -hmm. behind him are just an entire sort of array of street level yeah. heroes and villains from Kingpin to Spider-Man to Luke Cage, yeah. the defenders of course with lovingly alongside the uh, defenders and Spider-Man, our boy Moon Knight in his uh, new Bemis costume, keeping true to that. Yeah. And obviously we don't know how involved he will be in the story, but he will definitely be in Daredevil issue 600 and we will most assuredly be covering it here. So, oh, 100%. look out for solicitations this week. Yeah, it's um, being a Daredevil fan. This is uh, this is pretty cool. And on the front cover of this 600, uh, I must admit it's got all my favourite players. Mm, as well. Absolutely. Uh, you've got uh, yeah, along Moon, and Moon Knight is um, he does kind of stick out, doesn't he? And again, if you look at it, all the other um, characters in there. Yeah, he's still kind of the loner, isn't he? I mean, you can associate yeah. everyone with everyone else, right? You've got the Defenders there. You've got Spidey and Daredevil. They usually always go together. Uh, you've got these cool... Um, I love this thing that they're doing with Black Black Cat at the moment, like how she pops up. Um, and she's kind of um, bubbling away uh, in that in that criminal underworld, uh, trying, to, trying to get a... Um, 
a, a stronghold on on um, the crime in the city. So you get her. Uh, a lot of the defenders, uh, criminals, they got kingpin. You have um, uh, oh gosh, his name eludes me at the time. But, um, Diamondback. Yep. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, so he, he's been in the Defenders a lot. Uh, you have Hammerhead there as well. Uh, and the guy at the back, would that be... Do you reckon that's um, the Owl, Connor? Or, or have I, I got do that not wrong? know who the Owl is, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, the Owl is just a, um, Leyland Owlsley. He's a, a a villain of Daredevil. Um, and he's kind of he's kind of got the, the Wolverine-like hair. But uh, he, he's just a... He's a Bit of a bit of a bad fella, and I think there's Electra there as well. I see. Is that right? Oh, uh, actually, I'm zooming in. I'm not sure if it is actually her. There's Misty Knight. She's got the bionic arm, and there's a, oh, I think it's Echo. I think that might be Echo. Oh, totally. I think so too. If you zoom right in, it, it's almost as well. Not that this is her power set or anything, but it looks like she's saying something, and there's some some sonic stuff coming from her mouth. Yeah, she's right under the A in the Daredevil yeah. title of the image, which we'll post in the show notes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, very excited to, to see what Moon Knight does in this um, as well. Uh, remember Looney's in um, the very divisive Shadowlands uh, arc with Daredevil and, and these characters. I mean, I think nearly all these characters were on there. Uh, Moon Knight had a, had a pretty good little run in that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, interesting to see how long this one, this arc will go for. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah. a massive event with issue 600, so mm. hopefully Moon Knight will be there the entire way. Yep. Oh, I hope so. I hope he... Yeah, exactly. I hope he's not just on the fringe. Um, yeah, because, you know, you know, we all know that the, <laughs> his title um, <laughs> has got to be one of the stronger titles um, in Marvel at the moment, so it would be would be remiss to not do him justice in another book, I think. And we have that alongside Damnation, so we yeah. will be getting three Moon Knight involved titles a month. Yeah, yeah, which is crazy. Cray, cray. <laughs> so, with that, <laughs> with that, with that, Connor. Um, how about we? Um, how about we kick off some of our book reviews? <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. So we covered um, Defenders Volume 1, Issue um, 47, back in Episode 11. So if you kind of want to go back or if you remember, we had the bare bones in that um, yes. in the show notes of that Episode 2. So if you, if you just want to give that a quick read. Yep. And um, that was, uh, and that was a- sorry, that was narrated. That was our first bare bones guest narration by, um, oh, wow. by John Harrison from the Defenders TV podcast. So uh, that was, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, for Over the Moon, um, and for the Bare Bones, I have a little special, special treat. <gasps> I uh, I did manage to get to get someone. Is it Macy? No, it's not Macy. It's not the little cat Macy. It is actually. Um, geez, I hope this is the one. Uh, it is. Uh, I got Conchu to uh, <laughs> to, to guest narrate. Uh, I know, I know. You can't believe it, but it is absolutely true. So <laughs> I'm going to throw it over to um, our Dark Overlord, Conchu, um, to, to give us the, the bare bones. Hello, my name's Conchu. When I'm not buggy Mark Spector, I like to read Bare Bones for Over the Moon. This review, we look at Offenders, Volume 1, Issue 48, Who Remembers Scorpio, Part 1, Sinister Saviour, released June 1977, with writer and colours David Craft, artist Keith Giffen and Dan Green, Letters Annette Kowicki and editor Archie Goodwin. Nick Fury stands before Scorpio, who also happens to be his brother. Scorpio's initial plan to engage with Carl Richmond, aka Nightwing, was thwarted 
by the defendants, and so it was that Nick Fury sought to abduct Jack Norris as a contingency plan. Although Norris's abduction by Fury was stopped by Moon Knight, as seen in The Defenders issue number 47, Fury's cunning allowed him to manipulate the situation and trick the Defenders into handing Jack Norris over to S.H.I.E.L.D. With Scorpio's master plan not yet revealed, and with the two brothers waiting for Jack Norris to be delivered, there's nothing left to do but pick up some beer for their impending hostage. At the Avengers Mansion, the Defenders, alongside Moon Knight and Wonder Man, are still picking up the pieces from their unfortunate confrontation with each other in the issue of trial. Wonder Man is worried at the state of the mansion, whilst Jack Norris and Valkyrie exchange words with an undercurrent smoldering beneath. Jack is still resentful towards Valkyrie for taking over his wife's body, and Valkyrie can't help but feel responsible in some way. All are still reeling at the message they had received from Nick Fury only moments ago, demanding that Jack Norris be handed over to S.H.I.E.L.D. As Fury arrives to pick up Jack Norris, Moon Knight makes a stealthy exit, with the others only realizing all too late. Fury's behavior towards Norris and his suspicious manner spell trouble for Norris, and he soon catches wind that he's found himself in more trouble than originally thought. We briefly see the Incredible Hulk lurking in Central Park amongst the shadows. He is bored and a little fed up with humans, so he ponders how he can have some fun. Nothing more is shown here as it teases events in the future issues. As quickly as Hulk's cameo comes, it goes just as fast, and we see Valkyrie and Hellcat astride Aragorn, Valkyrie's flying steed, discussing the recent events with Jack Norris. Valkyrie is disillusioned and feels slightly betrayed at the harsh words Jack recently hurled towards her. Hellcat reassures Valkyrie that she understands what she's going through as they fly back towards the Defender's headquarters. It's not long before they return, and there they meet Nighthawk, who has startling news for them. Not long before, he received a phone call to notify him that Scorpio has abducted Jack Norris shortly after he was handed over to Nick Fury, and this angers Valkyrie, who cries that they have been deceived once again. Nighthawk mentions that Norris is being held for ransom, and demands $500,000. Nighthawk makes the arrangement and prepares to take the ransom money to the drop-off himself. Meanwhile, Jack Norris is brought before Scorpio by Nick Fury, and amidst offers of beer and grandstanding, Scorpio finally reveals to Jack Norris his devious creation. It's the Zodiac Chamber. Constructed alongside Nick Fury, the chamber is a theater of genetics and creates a new life form each month for Scorpio to control at will. It's here that we see the return of our favorite hero, Moon Knight. He has in fact been trailing Nick Fury ever since Fury came to collect Jack, and now Moon Knight finds himself on the roof of Scorpio's lair. Unfortunately, Scorpio's security entraps Moon Knight, and he finds himself in a chamber soon to be sealed and filled with water. Scorpio tosses Moon Knight a can of beer, and with that, decides to call it a night. Jack screams protest at Moon Knight's apparent fate, but Scorpio and Fury are nonplussed at the situation. They ignore Jack's protests and head for bed. As dawn rises, Kyle Richmond prepares for the exchange, and we see at Scorpio's lair that, amazingly, Moon Knight has escaped his death trap. It matters not, as Scorpio has a meeting with Nighthawk, and so he departs, and shortly after he is perched high on top of a monument, with Nighthawk swooping in to make the exchange. 
He hurls a bag of cash at Scorpio and demands Jack Norris's release. But like every villain, Scorpio isn't forthcoming, and we soon hear of his actual plan. The $500,000 was just a ruse. Scorpio's real intent is to abduct Nighthawk himself. To Nighthawk's surprise, Scorpio knows his secret identity of Kyle Richmond, and so it is with this that Scorpio plans to gain the entire Richmond fortune. With his Zodiac key, he ensnares Nighthawk, and they both teleport away towards their destiny. And for us, the reader, and deity, towards the next exciting issue. There you go, loonies. Conchu has spoken. I do hope you enjoyed my narration. If not, then I shall rain a vengeance upon thee. Ta-ta. Hello, Connor? Oh, yes, you're back. Cool. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm back. Uh are you are you back? Yes, I'm still here. I'm not sure what happened there. I just kind of lost. There was just some weird whirring. I think that was I kind of uh, had the soundtrack. <laughs> that was that was Konshu. I think he took over mm. our podcast. So, uh, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, there you go, Loonies. Konshu um, with his narration and also um, playing havoc on our equipment. But, yes, uh, fun fact. Uh, while recording that, Konshu killed twenty people. Ah, so excellent. <laughs> yeah, I know. it's not bad effort. It's not not too bad, not too shabby, not too shabby, Konshu. Um, so yeah, Connor. Um, this issue, uh, it, it was in next in the line of Moon Knight's appearances in comics. Um, I guess as a whole, uh, overall impressions. What did you think of this issue? Actually, it's weird to say really enjoyed it, but I definitely like enjoyed it. I thought it was a really fun weird issue like it's such a interesting look back at the times but just sort of how the story plays out and yeah. some of the characters which i have in one of my aspects which is just a list of yeah. everything uh, that i found weird but I, I, like honestly like it, it was honestly pretty captivating you know moon knight's sort of turn in and nick fury and scorpio's plans and there was just like plenty of elements that sort of kept my attention more than possibly you know, sometimes with dialogue being such a barrier than you can get into with old issue, older issues. But, you know, I, I, I was pretty captivated. And I do actually look forward to finding out how this plays out when we uh, do the next issue. Yeah, okay. I, I um, Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And exactly as you say, it was, um, it was, a, it was a comic of its time. Uh, there are certainly a lot of things uh, I'd like to know more about, like... Uh, in this, Nick Fury is definitely a an evil character, and uh, yeah, I just want to know what's the deal with that. I mean, I, and I yeah. know his, his brother is Scorpio, but um, yeah, he, he's uh, definitely got an evil bent to him, uh, and so that that was quite interesting. And I guess the fact that Moon Knight is not the center of this uh, of this comic. I mean, he makes a a pretty decent appearance, a guest appearance in here, but uh, we have. Uh, many other characters that we that we you know um that we're kind of entertained with like uh hellcat is pretty um in the back background here i think uh the thing with valkyrie and jack norris um i guess that ongoing uh there's a conflict there because uh because valkyrie inhabits the body i believe of jack norris's dead wife so so there's all these kind of weird little uh subplots and and uh, little issues between the characters, apart from the actual storyline itself, uh, yeah, I I did find it good. Um, well, let's crack into it anyway. Um, uh, I'll I'll hold off until our Crescent Art ratings. Um, but Connor, how about your uh, your first aspect? Um, what was my first? A- oh yeah, it's just sort of a list of questions from anyone who read this issue <laughs> and got some things that weren't in the narration because of the pure craziness. Okay, first, there's uh-huh. a point in this issue. Well, Hulk just sort of narrates about not wanting to smash yeah. and live a better life. <laughs> yeah. That was weird. That was Everyone is so dumb in this issue. They are. No one 
thinks about Nick Fury possibly being evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They just hand him over. Uh, like, they hand yeah, Jack oh, Nice I, over. Like, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, exactly. Like they don't, they, they aren't suspicious of him. I mean, you would have thought that in issue forty-seven, from issue forty-seven, they would be suspicious of him because Moon Knight catches Nick Fury, you know, um, at the warehouse with some of his Shield agents trying to kidnap Jack Norris. So, and that it doesn't look good. And Moon Knight attacks him. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like he's forgotten. Moon Knight's at least forgotten all about that. And uh, yeah, they just say, okay, we'll hand you, we'll hand Jack over to to Nick. Bit weird. Um, and it's just on Nick Fury being evil. There must have been a sort of a couple of issues before this. Maybe he's brainwashed, or mm. I don't yeah, know. I, like I don't know. I haven't read a lot about Nick Fury. He sort of when I started reading comics, he had his uh Max series mm. kind of floated around for a bit. And before I knew what I was reading, Jason Aaron's run, and he became the Watcher. So ah, you know, I'm not this. too sort of inclined about Nick Fury, but from what I know, he can be a bit uh, morally dubious, but for yeah. the most part, a good guy. Yeah, that's how I see him, but uh, it definitely doesn't look like it here, so that's, um, yeah, that's a bit strange. What were the other um, questions you have here, Connor? Um, Scorpio's plan is so weird, so when you write mm-hmm. about, yes. like, normal world being so mundane and uniform and everyone's so obsessed with being normal... And his solution to, like, making the world more, I don't know, interesting is by mm. creating, like, a new, like, yeah. what is it? Like, Zodiac creatures? Zodiac like, creatures. New so, life forms every yeah. month? What is that going to do to the world? I have I no idea. <laughs> his plot is a little paper thin, isn't it? It's not really, um, yeah, exactly. There's no, I think he even mentions as well, I'm not sure if it's in this um, issue or the next issue. But he mentions that he, he's had kind of like he's basically a bit lonely, <laughs> and then it seems like he's making these life forms because he doesn't have many friends around him. And I mean that's not that's not a good enough plan, really, is it? To to create it's eleven. Just such a weird motivation. <laughs> it is. It Even is very strange. Worse than Conquer Lords. I'm gonna put it out there. Conquer Lord <laughs> better than Scorpio. <laughs> oh no, Conquer Lord v Scorpio. That would be a great tussle. Like I think stuff. so. Beam is drawing it. Get it at uh, okay, yeah. Burrows. Get Burrows drawing it. Get it as brutal as possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's certainly daft as well as you're saying, Connor. Everyone's pretty dumb because also, um, there's a, I don't know, there's, I guess there um, has to be a, a, a bit of tightening up with the, the writing, I'd think. I mean, you have an evil mastermind here and then at one point he's uh, very driven, very intense and then in the next moment, he's saying, oh, you know, don't forget to, to pick up some beers on the way back because we, we've got to, you know, we've got to provide for our hostage. Like, what are you? Are you a host or, a, a, you know, are you, you know, trying to trying to make this guy feel well accommodated? And he tosses Moon Knight a beer in the, in the, uh, in the death trap as well. Got to stay classy. I just think that's, a, that's pretty hilarious. You wouldn't get that, you know, you wouldn't find your Dr. Dooms doing that, would you? You wouldn't find your... Uh, uh, who else? Your Magnetos or your Red Skulls? Uh, yeah, so a bit, a bit of an odd character, Scorpio, I think. Yeah, oh, and the last one, there's just one panel where, uh, is it Carl Richardson? Mm-hmm. Uh, Carl Richmond. Richmond. <coughs> Exit is, exits his house and I counted it. There is just 18 newspapers on his porch. Oh, really? From like a paper boy. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know what kind of joke the, uh, the, uh, Giffen was having when he drew that panel, but for some no, reason there's just 18 newspapers. Is that an in joke? Let me I don't uh, know. let me pull that up. Uh, what was I reading? I was reading something um, not that long ago, Connor. I think it was yesterday. Oh, oh yeah, I was reading a um, I was reading Batman Nightfall. Um, you know, don't worry, loonies, I'm not betraying you. I was reading, <laughs> I was reading Batman Nightfall, and uh, Doug Munch uh, was the, the writer. Funnily enough. And there was a lot of, um, as Batman goes in the streets, you know, and, and races in the Batmobile, there are a lot of uh, newspapers, you know, f- um, flying in the wind. And he's made a point to put, like, I think they're like social commentary on each of the front pages. So you have clear headlines about, um, I don't know, I, th- I can't remember what they were, like about sustainability or, uh, uh, you know, some political statement here and there, which I think is pretty funny. So I'm just looking at this page that you're mentioning and uh, you can't see anything on the on the papers, right? Other than, 
other than it's just a pile. Is that correct? Yeah, there's just a, yeah, they're just like rolled up newspapers from a paper boy on his porch. Uh, oh yes, I can. Oh, there, you, I see it. Yeah, <laughs> and there are some on 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 the uh, on the roof, and there are some in the, yeah, in the bushes. Yeah, in, in the bushes. That is yeah. a bit strange. What the hell is going on there? Page twenty-seven. Page twenty-seven. He he walks out with his uh with the five hundred thousand dollars to make uh to give um Scorpio at the drop off, and he walks past all these tossed newspapers. It's it's really funny. I I I've got no idea, Connor. I have no idea. That might be a I don't know. It might be a bit of a jab at newspaper boy deliveries. <laughs> I don't know. You Actually, could... and it's funny you brought that up. That was something I forgot to write down in my notes that I was like so desperate to put down. That sort of like headlines with the social comedy mm-hmm. commentary. There is a lot of like really specific social commentary about pollution in New Jersey. Ah, right. And like yes, like air pollution. It's just. Obviously, you know, putting your political messages as comics do, but I don't know. It just, just the dialogue of the time makes it stick out like a sore like a, thumb. You yeah. know, there's no, there's no subtlety or yes, yeah. I think, I think that's, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. There's no subtlety. I think we can, I think we can sum up. Um, you know, I mean, having, you know, reading it back now, you know, I don't want to take anything away from it. It was, uh, it, it's an enjoyable read and, and everything. But uh, looking back now with the. Um, you know, uh, with hindsight, uh, yeah, things certainly do stick out. Um, so that's uh, that's a bit strange. Um, one of my aspects I had was um, first, yeah, was basically Scorpio, the main the main dude, Scorpio. Um, him being the brother of Nick Fury, which um, I found str- I never knew Nick Fury had a had a brother, like, uh, and, and let alone. Me neither. And this is the Scorpio. The Spider-Man faces? No. That's uh no Scorpion. That's uh Mark Garg. Oh, I right. think. I think maybe that's maybe what you yeah. Um but yeah, Scorpio, uh yeah, I just found him a very strange strange character. He, he's as you already covered um his plan for creating the Zodiac Chamber with Nick Fury um doesn't seem to be justified as to, you know, what what are you gonna do with these these people? Um and, and and I yeah also another thing I found um, he kind of uses Jack Norris you know is his hostage but Jack Norris becomes almost like his his uh, dog's body and and kind of um, his servant while he's while he's sleep captive in the yeah <laughs> sleep in the corner uh, and like Jack is like really worried that you know Moon Knight has been dropped in this death trap uh, but Scorpio says oh. Nah, I'm, look, I'm I'm going to bed. <laughs> like, <laughs> like such a domestic thing. Like, you know, so you got him tossing, uh, buying beer, like on the way, you know, back to his lair, and you have him just, yeah, I'm just going to call it a night, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to fall asleep on my bed. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's very, very strange, um, very strange character. I guess you get more of an insight, and maybe that's something that villains these days we should be having more insight into. You know. <laughs> Seeing what, yeah, seeing where what, does uh, yeah, where did the truth sleep at night? Yeah, exactly, exactly. When he's hungry, does he enjoy what, a nice cold beer. Does he have yeah, a nice cold beer? What's his favorite cafe? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, because we've got to get in touch, emotionally in touch with him. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so Scorpio is a, it was funny. He was a one of the aspects I had, and uh, the other one was just a, it was a rather simple one, and it was that Moon Knight. Um, is still very much a lone wolf here. I mean, he's a guest appearance, so it's not his book or anything like that. So he he's part of an ensemble, uh, but he's not really part of the defenders as well. And and he carries out his own missions as well. You see him like trailing uh, Nick Fury, uh, so he he doesn't follow the tune to to Nighthawk or, or Valkyrie, uh, and he'll leave and and um, do whatever he wants when he wants. So. Uh, is very much still established as a lone figure. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah uh, I, that kind of led to sorry. yours as well, Connor? Yeah, yeah, I was just about to follow that up. Just uh, let you say your piece and then sort of add to it with my aspect that um, it's it, it's kind of cool um, in this issue – his lone wolfness, as I wrote, that isn't a real term, <laughs> sort of actually leads to him being the uh, the smartest of this issue. You know, he's the one who tracks, who's the only one who sort of saw what happened to Jack and believed him and followed him down to 
and actually, as soon as they handed him over to Nick Fury, Moon Knight followed and led the charge and actually ended up at Scorpio's uh, lab. He was a... Uh, sort of defeated but the fact that he still gets out and his prowess at breaking in and then breaking out sort of really sort of put moon knight as sort of the big the the mvp of this issue and maybe that was like a push to help get moon knight into readers but regardless it's just kind of it's kind of nice seeing moon knight almost take the stage and even like the thing at the end seems moon knight's going to have even more of a presence in next issue as he leads the charge to saving so moon knight the smartest and the strongest, sort of. Wonder Man's not really doing anything with this issue. Oh, no, absolutely. If you look at the all the other defenders, um, they don't really do anything like this whole issue. Nighthawk actually ends up getting captured by by Scorpio at the end. He makes the drop-off, you know, in the attempt to try and get Jack Norris back, but he doesn't do anything. It's actually Moon Knight, who is not part of the team. He's not part of the defenders. Uh, he actually drives the... Um, the pursuit to, to get Jack Norris rescued. So, uh, and uh, yeah, and towards the end, he um, he's disappeared. Like he escapes that the uh, the watery death trap that he he found himself in as well. So he's a he's a slippery customer. Um, and yeah, look, Valkyrie, Hellcat, they don't really do much as well. Um, it's all it's all Moon Knight. So um, for Moon Knight fans, it, we're pretty lucky to have him kind of. Um, Steering this, uh, steering this adventure. He cracked open a cold one with the boys yeah, in the done. ring. He's even got time. There to is do a that. very specific panel of him opening it. Yeah, yes, and he looks almost like the ultimate um, version, ultimate universe Moon Knight. There, true, actually, yeah, yeah, sort of the way the face is drawn and the yeah. the shadows on it, even when the hood isn't over it. Yep, yeah, but he's very much still got his uh, his wrist um, connected glider cape. So still the older version here, uh, and uh, as mentioned, it's what it was 1978, 77 that this was released. So um, it's well before he had his own series. Um, so that that makes sense. 1977, yeah, yeah. So uh, so Connor, um, going on from what you mentioned about your overall impressions, um, Crescent Dart ratings. Uh, what would you yeah. Think? An interesting one, I think. You know, I think in a lot of ways it's a it's a pretty average issue. You know, the story kind of doesn't really work in a lot of ways outside of its action. Um, you know, the characters are all pretty weirdly written, dumb, and just sort of nonsensical in a way. Like someone was like, "Oh, this is a superhero comic," almost, and just sort of ran around with that. Um, you know, art's pretty of its time. You know, Keith Giffen definitely developed in the 80s more than his um, art here. This is definitely sort of like comparing spectacular Spider-Man Frank Miller to what he would do later. So it's, you know, there's nothing really to sing home about there either. But it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting issue. And, and like, the reading it for the show meant that I almost had to finish it. And I'm definitely not sad I did because I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how this arc finishes so yeah i guess for a totally average issue it had my attention and gets like a two and a half crescent darts <laughs> ah two and a half crescent darts yep yep uh look i'd have to share a lot of your sentiments as well i uh look to be a little harsher i i did find this one a little bit of a struggle to read through um maybe maybe because um we had planned to do resurrection war afterward connor so i may have been excited to, <laughs> to read that and and so i wanted to get through this but i did find this a lot more uh laborious to go through than say resurrection war and i do put that down to the um to the writing david craft there is a level of um of amusement i guess with scorpio uh i would still probably rate conquer lord as the the more amusing and the more that you can take oh, the piss sure. out of yeah because he's just ridiculous uh at least scorpio's costume looks look it looks kind of decent you know it's not it's not like conquer lords um but there, there are definitely a lot of tropes um that both conquer lord and scorpio share uh, but i found uh, as you pointed out i found his plan for the zodiac chamber i found that nonsensical i, I didn't really understand why he was really doing it, um, 
And, uh, yeah, and just, um, I don't know, there's a slightly unsettling thing with Nick Fury kind of still being evil. Um, and, you know, that might pan out later on. But um, with Moon Knight himself, I, I found he was good. He was good in the issue and, and um, happy to see that he, he was uh, making a positive impact um, in trying to save Jack Norris. Uh, but, yeah, overall it was a bit harder. Um, I would uh, I would give it... Uh, yeah, I'd give it maybe a a two out of <laughs> out of five. Fair, no, very fair. Yeah, I'm just trying to think because I think Conquer Lord. I think I gave I give I gave those issues two point something. So I'd have to I'd have to put this below that. Um, so yeah, yeah. So a solid two, two crescent darts yeah. to, the, to the eyes. It's <laughs> it's it kills its reader. It That's kills what its we're reader. trying to tell you. <laughs> It's, yeah, loony listeners, if you're at home and you think, well, this does not sound like something I'd invest my time into, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We won't take it to heart. Enjoy no. Konshu invading your ears with his bare bones and yes. that might just see you out to the end of this arc. <laughs> well, true. I mean, and it might be different as well. Um, you know, reading comics is a is a funny thing because... It's the same like, um, I guess, watching something on TV or in the films uh, in the fact that it depends on what mood you're in. And like, if you if you are in the mood for like a nostalgic, older styled comic run, then you can probably burn through all these parts, you know, consecutively and, and really enjoy it. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, d- as Connor says, just don't want to detract any of the loonies for, for reading this. It's certainly interesting to see, um, but... We, Connor and I, we are committed to covering every single appearance of Moon Knight. So, you know, there are, there are going to be some good ones. There are going to be some great ones. And there might be a couple of a couple of bombs in there along the way. But uh, it's all part of the journey. Heck, yeah. Well, I suppose with an issue like that, I suppose we uh, crack on to an issue that may just be a, a bit more bang for your buck. And uh, with that, uh, we will be introducing Moon Knight um, Volume 3, uh, the miniseries Resurrection War, narrated by none other than me in the Wild Wild West. And welcome back to Bare Bones. This week... Moon Knight, Volume 3, Issue 1, Resurrection War, Phase 1, Eclipsed, starring writer Doug Monch, artist Tommy Lee Edwards and Robert Campanella, colors Melissa Edwards, letters Ken Lopez, editor Mark Bernardo, film before a live studio audience, January 1998. Simon Darkover makes a monumental discovery after years of planning. At the tomb of Pharaoh Seti III, Darkover and his assistant, Howie, have finally reached the inner sanctum of the tomb. With one great final effort, they break through the seal, doing what others before them could not, and marvel at what stands before them. Undisturbed for more than 4,000 years, they finally set eyes on the statue of Set, the slayer of Osiris. God of darkness and death. Darkover intends to finally bring Set into the modern world, and so the story begins. Moon Knight finds himself buried, but it's not long before he hears someone dig him out of his grave. It's Scarlet Fascinera, the stained glass Scarlet, and as she insists to confuse Moon Knight out of his grave, she draws her crossbow and fires before Moon Knight has a chance to, to do anything. Her arrow finds his target. It's not Moon Knight, but Black Spectre, which it seeks, and as he crashes out of a nearby doorway, Scarlet's aim stays true, and with a thunk, Black Spectre falls dead. Moon Knight's confusion builds, as for no apparent reason, Black Spectre's body disappears, and before he can make sense of it, Stained Glass Scarlet disappears too, leaving only her her insignia and blood on the door which Black Spectre bursts from. 
curious. Moon Knight approaches the bloodstained door and tentatively opens it. On the other side, Moon Knight is astounded to see a gigantic apparition of Conchu before him, in what looks to be an astral plane. Conchu speaks to Moon Knight and decrees to Moon Knight that he is needed to fight against a dark avatar which has risen from its tomb and to do battle with this dark force. Elsewhere, in Cairo, as a risen moon remains eclipsed, Simon Darkover admires the statue of Set, which he has only recently removed from its tomb. It appears the statue looks back at Darkover, and he dismiss dismisses it as a sign of fatigue. Suddenly, as he leaves, he is attacked from behind and left for dead. What looks to be the statue of Set is seen to slowly walk away from the crumbled body of Darkover. Returning to Moon Knight, we see his hallucinations not improved, as Moon Knight found now finds himself in a graveyard. This time, it's the werewolf by night, which attacks Moon Knight, and after a vicious battle, Moon Knight gains the upper hand. He's about to deal the final blow. When the werewolf reverts back to Jack Russell, and Moon Knight is reminded of the innocence of Russell. He leaves Russell in the graveyard, and Russell is left to ponder the star contrast the two figures embody with the power of the moon. At Grant Mansion, we see Marlene and Frenchie standing outside, debating whether to return to the life with Stephen Grant. In what seems an illusion once again, Moon Knight is victim to false images before him. Marlene and Frenchie slowly turn to horrid corpses as Morpheus emerges from the darkness. In quick succession, Moon Knight's identities then appear to taunt him, not long before his greatest foe Bushman arrives to shoot them all down. The real Marlene and Frenchie Frenchie are indeed a grand mansion, and as they enter, Marlene gets a chill at how things have not changed at all. As she stares in the cold eyes of the statue of Conchu, a rumbling occurs, and in an unexpected burst, the statue explodes, revealing Mark Spector, alive and well and naked, very naked. He collapses, but soon recovers from a kiss by Marlene. All three are astounded at Mark's resurrection. They turn to see the statue of Conchu intact and showing no signs of having crumbled in order to bring forth Mark Spector. Mark reveals that before his resurrection, he had dreams which, he, which had appeared to foretell the future. He tells him of the confrontation he had with Stained Glass Scarlet, Black Spectre and the Werewolf. And just as he finishes his tale, the trio hear a, ha hear a howl from outside, a howl from a wolf. Wasting no time, Mark heads to the wardrobe and disregarding the clothes of Mark, Jake and Stephen, he chooses the garb of Moon Knight. With the eclipse over, Moon Knight's, Moon Knight's mind finds some form of clarity, and with this, coupled with his rebirth, Moon Knight vows to piece the clues of his dreams together and take on the dark force which lies ahead. All right, we're back. Nice. Thanks, me. <laughs> Thank you, audio version Connor, <laughs> narrator version <laughs> Connor, uh, <laughs> in the wild, wild west. Uh, yeah, wow, what a, what an, what an issue, uh, resurrection war. Uh, this is certainly a, a different pace from Craft <laughs> the Defenders, forty eight, um, and it's good to see a lot of familiar faces here, Connor. Like. I.e. the Rogues Gallery. Yes, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of lovely familiar faces. Uh, a particularly covered one here, uh, Scarlet Fascinera makes her debut. Mm hmm. Yes. Well, not debut, but return. She not returns. Debut. Yeah, it's great to see her back uh, as well. But um, yeah, so uh, overall impressions. Well, interestingly enough, when I read it. Um, because uh, we were going to do it last week before I uh, picked up my pops. Um, I actually really didn't like it. Oh, okay. I put down the issue thinking it was just pretty poorly written. And then I reread it for this week, and I definitely enjoyed it a lot more. I still don't think it's particularly great from a story writing perspective. Uh, as a sort of cover, I think it's very much the definition of a fine issue. It gets us from A to B to set up the the bigger events of the arc. Um, it has great art and colours, but yeah, I think generally pretty fine. I, I look forward to the next three issues, not like a, I'm looking too forward to the next Defenders, you know, I'm genuinely looking forward to seeing this big showdown between Set 
and uh, Khonshu and Boon Knight in the middle with all his rogues gallery, but it's definitely sort of in uh, this first issue that really just feels like just pure sort of pole placing for the story yeah. to come. But what did you think, Ray? Yeah, uh, um, two things that you covered there. I thought the two main things that really popped for me was, um, was one, the art, first and foremost, uh, is what kind of really drew me and really attracted me to to this issue and this whole this whole arc, uh, the art and I must say um, and the colours as well. So, uh, Tommy Lee Edwards and I'm assuming his relation Melissa Edwards, who's on colourist, is the, who's the colourist, just do an absolutely awesome job um, with the art here. So that was the number one thing that I, I was overall um, impressed with with this book. Uh, the other thing that I found that was kind of uh, that was obvious was uh, the gimmick of, of actually having all of Moon Knight's, um, you know, character uh, rogues gallery uh, there uh, and somehow write them in that he can actually fight them all, you know. So in that sense, Connor, I agree with you that using this gimmick um, kind of made this, made this book kind of lack a little bit of depth in that sense. Um, like, we all know Doug Monch can really write a good tale um but yeah yeah those two uh, actually and the third one that i found was really good and it's on the first page as well um i love this this introduction though or, or reintroducing uh the egyptian um kind of slant to to, to moon Knight. so we have yes yeah we have the archaeologists um uh unearthing set uh the uh, basically the god of death, um, and that ties into the, to the um, to the story. But you know, but before getting in, in any of that, that was the uh, that was the overall impressions. Uh, let's crack on to our aspects. Did you want to open with uh, your first one, which sort of ties yeah. into what you finished up there with? Yeah, sure. So yeah, exactly. So my first aspect was um, was this Egyptian themed story, and it, it I don't know, it, it does it does seem refreshing to to have something where kind of everything kind of um, yeah, revolves around it, uh, and, and not only in just Egyptian, whether it just be artifacts or the archaeologists, as as uh, we've seen here, but there being something greater to it. So again, um, we have uh, Set, who is the god of darkness, slayer of um, how do you pronounce it? Kind of Osiris. Yes. Os- yes. Osiris. Osiris and. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and having some sort of this dark evil um, that comes with, you know, almost a curse that comes with um, unearthing this this statue, and I loved how this uh, the story opens up with that, uh, and it just kind of, as you said, it, it kind of sets the scene for stuff for the for the four parts, um, but uh, that coupled with the brilliance of um, of the artwork uh, was I thought I thought really really good, um, and. What it manages to also do is then that it um, it kind of draws back uh, draws a lot into into Conchu himself. So um, Conchu, who who thankfully in, um, narrated our first uh, bare bones, we see him in this issue, uh, and there's a lot more of a uh, interaction here between Moon Knight and Conchu, um, which is great. Uh, when I say in here, it's really weird because um, we did jump. Um, from say the defenders in 1977 to this, which is in 1998. <laughs> so, um, but actually, having said that, um, I do know what preceded this. And um, prior to Resurrection War, we had Mark Spector, Moon Knight, and that finished up in 1994. Um, and that was, um, I think I've mentioned before, kind of that was a crazy, crazy, crazy hmm. time. Um, so it was good to, yeah, it was actually good to return to simple Egyptian. Kind of mythology, mythology and deities, um, yeah, which was one of the big aspects. What What were your thoughts on um, on Set and uh, Simon Darkover? And, uh, and I, yeah, I really loved it. Um, I think this is like the most Egyptian mythology uh, Munch has ever tied in. You know, his thirty eight issue series never really. Oh, uh, sort of near the end with Conchu becoming a sort of bigger player. Sort of, um, but you know, it was always sort of up in the air about 
Conchu's relation to Mark, and we saw that with Marlene. And it's kind of awesome here, got jumping from that to being a really big part. I love the setup of Set, his, uh, his nonchalant killing to uh, get out of there, and his, uh, his warning, almost, his threat to Conchu. And the fact we see Conchu talk, as someone who's going blind and on this, I really hope we see more of their dynamic and we just see, you know, even with the gimmick here, as you said, being Moon Knight fighting his rogue gallery, that in the later issue, Set really uh, gets some time to shine as a villain and isn't just left in the dust because he really is something really threatening and to to be afraid of. Yeah, I, I was um, I was hoping actually we'd see more of Set. Um, he appeared very briefly in the Lemire run. Um, in I, th- I think it was um, uh, Welcome to New Egypt, where where Mark enters New Egypt and uh, he finds Set um, tied up or in prison somewhere that Conchu had placed him in. Um, yeah, is is a really interesting character. Uh, would love to have seen it. And sorry, Connor, while you were um, just mentioning that, uh, also just further on to what I was saying, I guess Mark Spector Moon Knight, which was the volume before this. Um, was, uh, again, as we mentioned, um, consciously uh, didn't mention anything about Konshu or or Mark's other personalities. I guess that's why it was just Mark Spector, dot, dot, Moon Knight. Um, and it, would, it just purely focused on his mercenary um, side. So it was good to have this volume. This was almost a, uh, a deliberate, um, you know, about face and say, okay, let's, let's um, jump into the Egyptian side of things here. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, how about you? One of your aspects, Connor. Yeah, I'll talk about um, my uh, what was very much one of my grievance with this issue, and then sort of in my reread, uh, sort of something that I sort of came to appreciate more. So, um, with uh, Mark dying at the end of um, Mark Spector Moon Knight, this was sort of which came near and about the time where Marvel as a, as a company collapsed and went bankrupt. And so this came out just before, um, no, oh, I hope I have my timelines right, but this, uh, th- this actually came out just before the Marvel Knights brand actually started. Ah, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, so this was sort of reintroducing Moon Knight to new readers. So, you know, very much Mark, Mark Moon Knight had been dead sort of, not so much forgotten about, but very much disappeared for that four years. And this is very much a return to him um, and, you know, introducing him to new readers. And you can sort of see that Munch is writing here, having him on the story is really great, but you can see very much it seems very mandated to explain his history to the audience through the dialogue. And you can see that in well in High Strangers, which was the sequel miniseries to this that was... Oh, is is kind of a lot more regarded. Yes. Resurrection War is still talked about, but I think you know High Strangers is probably the more known, which probably represents that you know Monch could sort of tell a story without that introductory. And I suppose it's real sort of fifty fifty because in the second reread, I did sort of appreciate more how Monch presented this exposition and how he still devoted time to characters like Marlene and Frenchie. I liked um, I liked this set of a Concho and set as we talked about before. I thought that was a really strong part. Uh, Mark's identity's back, Moon Knight being back, but you know there's still sort of a lot of dialogue that's just kind of like, oh yes, it is me, Scarlet Fascinera, mm-hmm. like in that issue where you threw a crossbow at me and I was a nun, but I was a yeah. actor and, and I killed people. Like I, I I think it was kind of a smart way of doing it. Sorry, um, but you know still sort of. I suppose in whatever mood it was at the time, it just sort of didn't click as an enjoyable way to read this issue. Yeah. Which yeah. may have sort of soured the experience until my reread where I sort of enjoyed the issue as a whole and all the working parts that made it a much stronger issue. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Um, I can see... Well, I'm assuming there's a lot of editorial uh, influence here, as you mentioned. Like So, so Monch, you know, we all, we all know he can write a good story, um, but it was... It seemed like an obligation to... To explain the origins, as you mentioned, and then actually to show all his rogues gallery, like it's a quick fire way to kind of um, bring you up to speed with who Moon Knight's, you know, 
familiar characters and villains are. Uh, but yeah, I'd say a lot of it would have been driven by, um, you know, the editors saying that you know you've got to you've got to write this in um, into it. So yeah, yeah, as um, and that, that kind of leads to, to to my other aspect, which was basically yeah the the rogues gallery of um, of villains. So you do you do start with um, Scarlet, um, and she's almost kind of like I guess. She's a confidant with Moon Knight, um, and and we immediately get Black Spectre. Uh, then there's a tussle with uh, the werewolf at, at the, uh, the cemetery, uh, and then you also get Morpheus um, and also Bushman towards the end. So uh, it's a good way to actually kind of see them all. Um, and again, I can't get away from just the colours that Melissa Edwards uses. Um, she uses really nice um, fluorescent, like kind of greens and purples, which really do um, give a, I don't know, like a supernatural element to it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's good to see that Grant Mansion is back um, in Long Island, where they return to. Uh, and remember as well, like, uh, so when, when, um, when we do see Marlene and Frenchie go towards uh, the mansion... Uh, they are under the belief that, you know, the Mark... Last time they saw it, Mark had died, basically, um, at Spectre Core, uh, with, I think, the virus. Um, it was some crazy 90s thing kind what of... What a weird way of dying. It was a very I can't strange... can't wait one day we tackle that. That'll oh, be interesting God, we will, Yeah, that will... Yeah, we'll need to set aside some time for that. Uh, but then, yeah, I mean, then he he, he explodes out of the uh, Conchu statue. So, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's a very it's a it's a strange tale, um, but Mark is indeed back and he's looking in fine form. Uh, but yeah, his rogues gallery were, were pretty cool, and you know you can assume that um, set um, this this evil Egyptian god of death has something to do with resurrecting them in some capacity. Uh, but yeah, I um I definitely agree with all of that, and. You know, I had my gripes with the story, but it was kind of pretty cool to see Scarlet Fascinera and, you know, some fan favourites like Morpheus. Bushman makes a short appearance. He does, and he uses his teeth again. <laughs> yes, in a very brutal way. Yeah. Um, I really like Jack Russell's inclusion, actually. I do too. I like that, Um, you know, you sort of start with the morally ambiguous Scarlet Fascinera against the evil Black Spectre. And then you sort of see two halves of living as Moon Knight in the superhero coin as Jack Russell. I think that's like a pretty smart way of showing every side of Moon Knight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sort of his relationships, his his villains, the, the brutality that comes across. And, you know, once again, like I, I think this is a real sort of startup issue, but I'm excited for next week where we see all these villains actually get into the fight and we can really sort of pick apart how they, pick apart how they characterize. But I think... You know, this is obviously Munch. This, uh, these are literally, oh, except for Jack Russell, literally all of his creations that he's just getting to toy around with. So obviously, of course, they're well written. And you know, Jack Russell, he was on that issue, uh, that book for like eighteen issues. So you know, there's really no faults with characterization. Or once again, I really like the the scene with the one character who isn't really his um rogues gallery sort of. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. He, um, there's one thing, Connor, I thought maybe I'd just like to touch upon. It was a little confusing, and I, I just want to see your interpretation as well. So um, if we were to look around, say, page 14, where we're established at Grant Mansion, and uh, Marlene and Frenchie are at the mansion wanting to go in, and then they're kind of accosted by Morpheus. Um, it's just a little... So what happens there... Is that an illusion by Moon uh, for Moon Knight? That I guess has Marlene and Frenchie actually gone to the mansion because they have towards the end of the issue they do, but we have here uh, Morpheus coming along and they're almost petrifying um, as Morpheus comes closer, and then Moon Knight screams, "Oh no!" You know, um, and then he gets uh, he has a conversation with his other personalities. Did you? How did you read that? To me, it was a little honestly, confusing. I was just as confused as you were. It just, in a lot of ways, just totally didn't uh, didn't make sense. It sort of, um, 
it's it, 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 I, I sort of get the reality bending, but it kind of just didn't work. It just sort of confused more than there was no sort of real standpoint to where it became the 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 real and the dream. Obviously, I think that's still Moon Knight observing from his dreamlike dead yeah. state. Okay, because it, yeah, yeah, it is, is haunting. It, 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 I do get that sense that. Um, I think not only during this issue, but maybe during the, some of the other issues as well. Yeah, this blur of what's real and what isn't is um, is not really is not defined as well as you'd think. I mean, I know if you want to blur something, you obviously you don't define it, but um, it just yeah, it just came across as a little confusing. Um, I mean, and also as well, if you look at it uh, towards the end of this issue when Mark bursts out of the statue. Um, I mean, I know we're dealing with comics here, but that kind of I didn't make any sense of that is that he burst out of did he burst out of his dreamscape after he talked to Conchu um, you know on that on that astral plane wherever he was maybe he was in like an astral you know how he's fighting all the other villains um, and that's obviously not in reality that must be in some sort of spiritual manifestation of wherever he is um, and maybe yeah. yeah maybe he burst out of the statue after speaking to Konshu back into our world. Is, is that... might make sense, I guess. Yeah, I didn't even think of it like that. That sort of helps put it in perspective, but it really is just sort of, oh, he's on the astral... Like, his weird reality also becomes Marlin and Frenchies as they see him break out of a statue that didn't break at all, and all of a sudden he's just back in reality. I wonder if it'll get explained because it really just it just kind of happens, I suppose. Yeah, he's just naked on the floor, and we're just kind of <laughs> I guess he's just supposed uh, to be tripped. <laughs> yeah, I guess you just um, you believe it as well, because okay, cool, cool. <laughs> just uh, a couple a couple of questions only. Yeah, because then I just wanted to go back at the very beginning when we first see him, and he's like almost buried alive. So somehow, when he died in Mark Spectre Moon Knight, he died. And I guess his spirit, or he somehow ended up some other place. This could be like Limbo or something. And that's where he meets um, Scarlet and, and everyone else. So, that, okay, that, that's, that probably makes sense. Anyway, loonies, I just thought, that was just a thought. I'm just trying to trying to make sense of it. Um, what did you think of Moon Knight's look in this issue, Connor? Well, that'll lead us on to... Um... Now, my final point, and a point we can all agree on, the incredible art and colours of Tommy Lee Edwards, uh, colourist Melissa Edwards, Edwards and yeah. Inca. Da, 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 let me just scroll to the first page. Uh, Inca. Uh, oh, Robert Campanella. Campanella. Yep. Robert Campanella. I think he, I think it's just such a gorgeous issue. And I think out of everything, the best thing about this, I mean, as you said before, the colors in this are crazy. They're so supernatural. Mm, they can be dream like. Really they cool. can be so eerie, so dark. The incredible shadows in this. Yeah, the shadows. And the way are awesome. she actually yeah. uses the blacks. Sorry yes. about that. No, no. That's. Uh, I'm just getting too excited at this art. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think the best thing, and it especially works so well with the colors, is Moon Knight's look in this yes. is just one of the best ever. Tommy Lee Edwards and the inks on this just nail this. Every scene is in the first one where he's waking up and he's half covered by shadows and he's so detailed in ink mm-hmm. and the really defined, well, sort of ill-defined shadow and black eyes and the the cape and the look and the way he blends into the shadows of the background. Yeah. It's, oh. just, you know, it's just so gorgeous to look at and just sort of – the best part, just I love looking at this Moon Knight. Yeah, it's certainly a treat, loonies. If you haven't seen Resurrection War yet or read it, um, yeah, please pick it up for the art. There's a lot that can really become wallpaper or uh, or posters even because because the colours pop out really well. Um, and as you say, Moon Knight here, I think he looks absolutely brilliant. He's got the red eyes, um, so you, it's not often you see him drawn with red eyes, but it just makes him look, you know, that all or more. Um, all the more, um, you know, badass. Uh, and, yeah, just the inking with the blacks and the whites. Um, there's one picture of him, and he's almost like a ghost. Uh, that is on, say, page, 
page 16. It's the one, it's the panel where Bushman is uh, ripping someone's neck with his teeth. Uh, and there's Moon Knight there going, no. And it's actually <laughs> just black and white. Um, but his silhouette is in white instead of black. Um, and it's, uh, I think it was, I think it's just really nice, um, a real nice touch there. Um, but yeah, I would really love to see Tommy Lee Edwards draw a lot more Moon Knight. I love his Morpheus as well. His Morpheus is really unearthly. Um, and his Frenchie is pretty cool too as well. He actually, Frenchie's got like a, a different hairdo. He's got, um, yeah, he looks, he looks very different from your, your typical, um, depiction of Frenchie. So yeah, so the art, the art for sure, Connor, is, is really, really nice. Um, you mentioned Tommy Lee Edwards. He, where, where's he from as well? Like where, what books has he, he done? He is still pretty, um, I wouldn't say prolific, but he's still running around. Um, as a listener of serious issues, you probably heard him talked about on um, the DC book Mother Panic. Oh, okay. He was the opening artist on that. Right. So the name probably sticks there. Um, if I pull him up, I'm sure he'll be on like a lot of a lot of books he sort of he sort of really kept up from the 90s and just sort of continued doing his thing yeah he's done runs on iron man star wars green arrow superman american alien oh uh, that's a that's a, hair, that's a uh, what's his name max something um that was a good one wasn't it american alien um, yeah yeah max uh, landis La- landis yeah 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 um hellboy daredevil Oh, Daredevil. Batman. Yeah. He, um, yeah, he really just sort of wait, makes his way around. Wolverine, uh, back in the stint between 2003 and 2009, when he had writers like Rucker and... Oh, okay. Um, Mark Miller. I've got to check um, more of his stuff out because it really is super impressive and I think it goes a long way to to what I'd finally give these uh, uh, Crescent Dart rating for, for this issue. So... Um, yeah, and having, yeah. having said that, um, Crescent Dart yeah. ratings. Yeah, well, I guess I'll take the lead here. Um, um, like I said, I, th- I think I still very much enjoyed this issue. Um, sort of got over some of my gripes. I think there is so little to fault about the art, but I think in the general scope of things, I'll be a bit sort of low rating with this and just say it's a... It's a good setup with some strong moments, incredible art for a for a good story to come. So probably a three and a half crescent darts <laughs> through the eyes, the nose, and the half dark. And I don't know, be thrown in his foot. Ah, uh, yeah, you you, uh, you took the rating right out of my mouth there, Connor. I was about to say Ooh. about yeah, three and a half as well. But um, I, I think that three and a half to a the yeah, majority yeah. of that is for the art. I think um, a lot of the weight waiting for that would be for the art. Um, yeah, setup issue. It was still it was still enjoyable, barring a few confusing um, confusing bits in there. Just like not knowing what reality, what is the reality or not. Um, you know, and as I mentioned, sometimes that is a fun and a nice thing to have. But other times, when you really don't know what's kind of going on, it kind of makes you kind of have to double check, and you know, it ruins the flow of the story. Um, but yeah, the art was good. I loved how the Egyptian element has come back. It's come back with a strength here um, after the Mark Spector run. Uh, and uh, yeah, to um, yeah, again, it's really mostly kind of about the art and, and an excuse to see Tommy Lee Edwards draw Black Spectre, the werewolf, Morpheus, um, you know, and even even Bushman looks pretty cool in this. Yeah, he does. Um, yeah, so yeah, a, a solid three and a half for me for this, and uh, and yeah, it, it does make me more excited. Um, in contrast to say the defenders issue earlier, it, it gets me excited as to what the next issue will hold. So uh, yeah, so there you go, loonies. Uh, a pretty decent three and a half average for for that issue. Some interesting, um, just this, uh, some interesting issues to cover. Sort of pulling from all the different pots, and we had some good discussions on. Uh, I think. Surprisingly deep in, uh, discussions on the Disney and Fox deal, so I think a pretty pretty rounded episode. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a it was a pretty good one, and very contrasting issues as well. So a lot of fun to talk about. Um, next phase, Connor. Next phase. Next we phase. Have, yes. can, the, Sorry. The, the next is the phases. <laughs> so many next phases. Yeah. Just gonna 
Next phase. We are continuing <laughs> both of these storylines, actually, yep. as we brought up. Both of these stories are nowhere from finished unless Defenders finishes next issue, in which case disregard that last comment. Because we've got Defenders, Volume 1, Issue 49, Rampage, following from directly where it left off. The same with Resurrection War with Moon Knight, Volume 3, Issue 2. You better believe it's the continuation. We're going to be having a good time talking about it. And not only that, we kind of have a special announcement too. Yes, we do have a, spe- a special announcement. Uh, hang on, Connor, is this about the the other episode? Yeah, it is. Okay, I don't cool. know what to call it. Special announcement. Okay, Can't work uh, for the moment. <laughs> oh yeah, special announcement, Loonies. Um, yeah, we're gonna we'll drop a, another a Christmas special uh, episode for you. Uh, and actually can't say too much more other than we will be reviewing uh, our first, re- another first for us, uh, we'll be reviewing uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. Let me get this right. Season 4, Episode 24, The Moon Knight Before Christmas. So um, we'll be looking at uh, the episode and going through it. Um, and uh, touch wood, we may have a special guest, Connor. So... Um, don't hold me to that, but we're, we're, you know, our management is trying to make it happen. <laughs> so yeah, that should be pretty fun. Um, so we'll we'll drop that in. Um, we'll make sure we'll have that out before Christmas as well, because we are we are hurtling towards Christmas, aren't we, Connor? What is it? The eighteenth now. So um, yeah, so so six days until Christmas Eve and a week till uh, Christmas Day. Yeah, time gosh. recording. Yeah, right. So, uh, yep, so we've got a plenty of work to do, but it will be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so look forward to that. Uh, a spectacle, Connor, anyone who want to shout out? Um, not particularly this week, but I do love all you loonies. Thanks so much for sticking around and keep listening. I Very suppose, much so. Just me, me too as well. I'd like to a big thank you once again to our our uh, moon god, Conchu, for, for narrating the bare bones for us. Um, a little bit of Connor and my soul has now been pledged to him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for um, the alternate reality, Connor, as well, for narrating the uh, the second bare bones. So, <laughs> so giddy up. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, Connor as well. Finally, I guess, where can uh, potential loonies find us? You can find us in plenty of places. We have our website, Moon Knight... Uh... Uh, www.intothenightpodcast.wordpress.com We're on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash itkmoonnight. We have an amazing group for discussion going all day long. Uh, Facebook.com slash groups slash into the night. Interact with all all these other great loony listeners. Uh, we've got a Twitter at itkmoonnight. You can email, email us about anything at moonnightpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube. You can find us on just about any podcast catcher, hopefully. We're invading most of them, we nearly are. all of them one day. So I think the point is we're spreading like a virus and we you'll are. be able to find us somehow. Just search for Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Exactly. Let's just hope there isn't a cure. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to share Connor's sentiments as well. Thank you, Loonies, again for sticking with us. Uh, yeah, we're... Um, we're slowly getting there, Connor, with the episodes. So uh, we've still got a while yet before we have uh, one year of this. But, um, yeah, it's something like, what, it's about four or five months now? It's been pretty good. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, episode 20, technically episode 21. Yes, that's right. That's right. If we were the legacy episode 21. <laughs> um, so uh, so thank you once again, loonies. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you shortly with a couple of other episodes just right around the corner. But I'll uh, I'll throw it to Connor to um, to take us out. Yes, uh, thank you all once again for listening, and may Conchu watch over the denizens of the night. Goodbye. Catch you later. Moon Knight and affiliated characters, stories, and events are properties of Marvel Characters Incorporated. Materials used and discussed within the podcast are intended for critique and review purposes only under the fair dealing concept of the current Copyright Act. The views, information or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the copyright owners.